only three of us, despite the fact that it's being videotaped. Please just interrupt when you have questions. That's natural to the to a session, anyways. So, yeah, there's nothing formal formal in that sense. Just feel free to ask. And it's really just being audio taped. We need to be audio recorded, but then we're going to connect it with the slides later, which is the future of podcasts and future of that kind of thing. And that's yeah. Great. Yeah. Audio. So I think it's. Yeah. We've done it with two so far. So it's recording now? Yeah. Okay. And so if I do quick introductions, you can cut that one. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 we yeah, can okay. do anything. Okay. Mm-hmm. No, I can introduce myself. That's fine. Okay, so just, just quickly before I actually start formally going through the slides, why, you're here obviously because you're coming back from maternity leave or a leave or somewhere else. You don't have to tell me the details. Cut this part of the slide. <laughs> um, uh, is there any other particular reason that you're, you're here to, to guide faculty as far as uh, research requirements. Um, how about you two? Just so I know, and when I'm going through this, will be cut. But uh, when I'm going through the actual presentation, then I can try to cater it a little bit to why you're here. Um, if you're just here for information purposes, that's completely fine as well. Okay. Okay, that's that's great because I did add in, anticipating that people would be coming just with a general interest in ethics. You'll probably have to do a project next year, is that right? At some point, yeah. At some point so this is a good thing to get on your radar uh, right away. So it'll be good for you. Yeah. Um, I'm a research manager here in Saskatchewan, and so I'm involved in the research Okay. Okay, so you're the perfect <laughs> audience. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Numerous, numerous people. <laughs> Okay, so that, that's fantastic, and then do interrupt me if you have specific questions, because sometimes I'm gonna talk a little bit about what requires review, and sometimes it can get a little vague when, it, when it's requirements within the health authorities and UBC. I'm gonna to speak to UBC a little bit. I'm gonna to try to zoom through that part and then just dive into the harmonization part. Um, okay, so I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, it's a quick overview of what I'm gonna to cover today. I'm gonna to talk about REB review and what what is required. Um, I'm going to try to swing that a little bit within the context of harmonization. Uh, I'll give some examples where some people don't anticipate that someone might, some, a study might be multi-jurisdictional, but is in fact. Uh, But, but also just as a reminder, because I I do actually think people are unclear about what requires review uh, locally, uh, and then how you take that local requirement and extend it uh, to the health authorities and other sites. Uh, I'll do a quick update and introduction uh, to the BC Ethics Harmonization Initiative. I'll look at how you can approach your harmonized review, so that will be specific to anybody who's doing research within two health authorities. Uh, And then I'm going to look at um, the different models for review, so what can you expect uh, from the harmonized uh, process? And then of course who to contact and questions, and as I've already stated, please just interrupt me um, as I go through and we can have a conversation about your specific questions uh, as we do it. So I wasn't gonna include this slide, but I am glad I did in the end, because this is just a, just really is an opportunity for me to remind everybody about the Tri-Council policy statement. Uh, This is the overarching Canadian policy framework for research involving human participants. So anybody who's doing research within Canada needs to be familiar with this document. Uh, uh, all researchers, obviously. Uh, The TCPS guidelines were recently revised in 2010 and 2014, uh, and UBC policies around research are all based on the Tri-Council policy statement. Another reason I wanted to flag this is just a quick reminder as well to people who are involved in research. Uh, The tutorial, the course on research ethics, the core tutorial there, is required of all students and residents participating in research. So you will have to do the core tutorial at one point. It's, a mo- it's done in eight modules. Uh, it is very, uh, I think it's very approachable. It's interesting. They, they're, they're updating it at one point, but it's interactive and you can follow different links. Uh, and so it can be quite, quite engaging and interesting. Um, and I like to extend that beyond just students 
and residents and really anybody who's involved with a participant's research data should be taking the core tutorial. We just don't require it at this point, uh, but we're moving towards doing it. And lots of institutions do require it. I mean, I actually, I, at one point, I think I actually put everyone, yeah, I did. I put everyone involved in research should take the tutorial, and then I should have just eliminated the required part. Um, it's, it really, everybody should take it. It's a good set. Yeah? Yeah. That's perfect. And, I, and actually, the sooner I think you do it in your education career, it just gets ethics on your radar. Mm -hmm. Because I think what happens a lot of times, it's not that people are unethical by nature, they just don't realize what the, what the guidelines and requirements are. So moving on, I wanted to talk about the key definitions in the Tri-Council Policy Statement around what requires review. I'll talk quickly about UBC policy in that context uh, here and then what happens when you make it multi-jurisdictional. Uh, so the definition of research, the Tri-Council Policy Statement says, uh, research is an undertaking intended to extend knowledge through a disciplined inquiry or systematic investigation. It defines human participants as those individuals whose data or responses to intervention stimuli or questions by the researcher are relevant to answering the research question. Um, so if you're doing the first, and a recent revision of the Tri-Council Policy Statement actually clarified uh, systematic investigation to really mean whatever would be considered research within your field. We've obviously grappled with this definition a long time, and it's, it's not the clearest, and it's hard, it's, you know, it's, it's, it can be ambiguous, but, but, so that would mean if you're doing what the School of Nursing would be considered nursing research, and you're involving human participants, uh, you would require review at UBC. Um, there's just a caveat there, which I, I won't go into, but, it, well, in persons or personnel who are authorized to release information or data in the ordinary course of their employment about organizations, policies, procedures, professional practices, or statistical reports are not considered participants. The example I use there usually is myself. If you're doing research ethics, you're doing a, you know, a, a research project on research ethics across Canada, and you're looking at, you phone me up and you ask me what UBC's policies are, um, how many people are on our board, where did the, where, which, which disciplines do they come from, you ask me what, um, you know, how UBC interprets in Policy 89, the Tri-Council Policy Statement, I can release that information to you without being considered a participant because it's not my data that you're using. You're just really using stuff that would be publicly available anyways. You, you probably could find the same information on our website. If you start asking me my, my opinions on the Tri-Council Policy Statement or ethics creep or whether or not we, you know, the nuances of what happens within our board deliberations, for example, and I start to give you sort of long drawn out opinions, then, then the, sh the focus of your research shifts from being about the policies and procedures to being about my opinions on the policies and procedures. So when that happens, then I become a participant and then your research would require a review. Uh, policy 89 is the UBC policy, and this is, this is where I wanted to talk a little bit uh, to this in the context of harmonization. So if you're conducting research um, as defined by the, or the TCPS2 um, and you are a faculty member or student or you are affiliated uh, with the university, you would require a review. The second bullet uh, there is if you're using UBC facilities that wouldn't be otherwise publicly available, you would require a review. Or if there's a different requ requirement from an uh, other agency that you have some sort of agreement with that requires review, you would require a review. Uh, the reason I put this in here is that a lot of people don't realize, especially in your case, let's say you're a faculty of nursing at UBC, you're working at Island Health, uh, you're doing a qualitative research project on shift work and sleep schedules and nursing, um, and you're doing it at Island Health and Interior. A lot of times, you, the, the faculty is well aware that they need it at Island Health, and they're well aware that they need it at Interior, but they don't think of their affiliation with UBC as also requiring review here. So what in their heads is two sites is actually three for requirements. And the same goes for, for two sites. Uh, and we see this a lot. People are exclusively doing research in a health authority, uh, but they're affiliated or faculty at UBC. They may get the checks for the health authority, but they forget to do the research ethics component here. And actually sometimes it goes the other way. But because of operational approvals, it often can, it sort of gets checked at the health authorities as well. 
Uh, so you need to think of those as double sites or, or multi-jurisdictional research. So although it's important to understand when you do require review, I'm just going to run through two quick slides where you wouldn't require review. Uh, you don't require review on research. So you, your research would fit into the definition of research. But if it relies exclusively on uh, publicly available um, information that is either legally accessible to the public or appropriately protected by law, or publicly accessible information with no reasonable expectation of uh, privacy, then you would not require review. So a, a good example of the first one would be Stats Canada data. A lot of public archives would fall under the first one where there's an appropriate guardian in place uh, to govern the use of the data uh, within uh, the facility. And publicly available information is anything that you might pull from the stacks. At UBC, blogs, some blogs um, that can get finicky, but I won't go to, into that. Anything that you could pull from a website where you don't need a username to sign into, uh, anything you pull, you know, yearly reports, these sorts of things that you can pull from a company's website that's, that's put out there to the public for the public uh, wouldn't require review. Secondary use of anonymous information or human biological materials, so long as the process of data linkage does not generate identifiable information, uh, does not require review. Just as a caveat, UBC Policy 89 uh, basically defines uh, genetic material as never really being anonymous. So in that case, the human biological materials is almost never exempt. Um, and in fact, I would say it's never exempt. I've never heard of a case where it is. Uh, however, secondary use of anonymous information that was collected for something other than research, you can use without review. So a good example of that would be quality assurance assessment that you did with a class you were teaching and it was anonymously collected, so you never collected names or identifiers on it. Uh, you could use what was originally collected for evaluative purposes uh, with no research intent. Uh, you could then use it later on for research. Uh, as long as there was never any identifiers attached to begin with. Uh, the same goes for a project where you know, it was anonymously conducted where names and identifiers weren't, and you changed the, the, the reasons that you were using it for. And was there information in addition to that around anonymous information, that, what that means? As a yeah. Is it related, not that you have to go through now, that yep. people can access because it's anonymous, but then it could be identifiable by the size of the group or other... Yeah, so, so the key, and we're, we'll go over that, obviously if, if put in together, if it's, if it's anonymous, but then if you put it together and it creates identifiable information, it wouldn't qualify as being anonymous. Uh, also the, the index of the, the Tri-Council policy statement has uh, um, a glossary uh, of terms, and they very clearly describe what they mean by anonymous, and de-identified and anonymized. And, and there is actual important subtleties in this. Anonymous means there was never. You couldn't, if you wanted to, figure out where that info, who that information could be attributed to. Uh, anonymized would be if um, you know, it was collected with identifiers, it was permanently removed. De-identified usually means that there is a link. Uh, it may be you don't have access to it, but it exists. Uh, so just along uh, Patricia's question there, um, around activities that don't require review. Sorry. Um, oh, I guess I didn't, no, I didn't, no, I did, it's right here. Uh, naturalistic observation, and this is important, and you can kind of borrow it for, for your question as well. Uh, it doesn't require review when no intervention is staged by the researcher or direct interaction with individuals or groups. Uh, individuals or groups targeted for observation have no reasonable expectation of privacy, and the dissemination of research results does not allow uh, identification of specific individuals. So that last one sort of speaks to what you were talking to um, and is important to keep in mind because a lot of times, in fact, I went to a seminar a number of years ago and this, this researcher from Toronto put up what you would think were completely, it was something like age, age and sex and neighborhood. And he, using a series of a whole bunch, boom, boom, he could figure these things out very quickly and what you think are very general identifiers could very quickly put together, created either solid matches or pretty 
close, like reasonable assurance that this is the person you're talking about. And it was, it was kind of telling. <laughs> I had to admit I had a moment there when I was like, oh. Um, but it was fascinating as well. So, and especially today when we have so much technology and ability to collate data and quickly, um, what used to be anonymous or really out of reach for re-identification isn't, even with genetics and stuff like that, it's just becoming more and more accessible. Uh, what we you know, didn't dream was possible 15 years ago is very possible today, and those advances are just coming quicker and quicker and quicker. Um, activities not requiring review, I just, I think this is an important